Yet, even without the canals, the exploration of Mars evokes the kind of rapture that Columbus or Marco Polo must have felt. We see many impact craters, but we find no canals, none at all. There are fault lines in the surface and complex patterns of ridges and valleys, but they're all far too small and in the wrong places to be Lowell's canals, and they don't seem to be manufactured. There are many signs of water. Ancient river valleys wind their way among the craters. Nirgal Valley, named after the Babylonian war god, is a thousand kilometers long and a billion years old. There seems to have been a time when Mars was much warmer and wetter than it is today. I wonder if life ever arose in the muddy backwaters of these great river systems. The waters flowed at the same time that the great volcanoes of the Tharsis Plateau were made, before the present continents of Earth were formed. It was a very lively epoch on Mars. Equally old is the Mariner Valley, a strange, vast, mist-filled chasm. If it were on Earth, it would stretch from New York to Los Angeles. Landslides and avalanches are slowly eroding its walls, which collapse to the floor of the valley. There, the winds remove the particles and create immense sand dune fields. Signs of high winds are all over Mars. Often craters have, trailing behind them, long streaks of brighter dark material blown out by the winds natural weather vanes on the Martian surface. For the sand to be blown about in the thin Martian atmosphere, the winds have to be very fast, sometimes approaching half the speed of sound. But some of the patterns are so odd and intricate that we cannot be sure they're caused by wind-blown sand. And there are other strange markings, furrowed ground, almost resembling a giant plowed field a billion years old. And one of the strangest features on Mars, the pyramids of Elysium, 10 times taller than the pyramids of Egypt. Perhaps they're only mountains sculpted by the fierce winds, but perhaps there's something else. How marvelous it would be to glide over the surface of Mars, to fly over Olympus Mons, the largest known volcano in the solar system. The surface area of Mars is exactly as large as the land area of the Earth. It will be a long time before this planet is thoroughly explored. The only canal of Percival Lowell that corresponds to anything real is Mariner Valley. 5,000 kilometers long. It's a little hard to miss even from Earth. The Grand Canyon of Arizona would fit into one of its minor tributaries. Someday, we will careen through the corridors of the Valley of the Mariners. To skim over the sand dunes of Mars is, as yet, only a dream. But we have, in fact, 
sent robot emissaries to Mars. Their names are Viking 1 and Viking 2. The problem was where to land them. We knew that the volcanoes of Tharsis were too high. The thin Martian atmosphere would not there support our descent parachute. The great Mariner Valley was too rough and unpredictable. The polar caps were too cold for the lander's nuclear power plant to keep it warm. There were fascinating places that were too high or too windy or too hard or too soft or too rough or too cold. We worried about the safety of every landing site. Perhaps we were too cautious. Eventually, we selected two places. One optimistically named Utopia for Viking 2, and another 8,000 kilometers away, not far from the confluence of four great channels, a landing site for Viking 1 called Chrysi, Greek for the land of gold. And so, after a voyage of a hundred million kilometers, on July 20th, 1976, Viking 1 landed right on target in the Chrysi Plain. It was less than 80 years since Robert Goddard had his epiphanal vision in a cherry tree in Massachusetts. After hibernating for a year during its interplanetary passage, Viking reawakened on another world. The first thing it did was to call home, reporting a safe arrival. It began to rouse itself according to instructions memorized months earlier. First, it put out a finger to test the Martian winds. Then, flexing its arm, it flung off a protective glove. Next, Viking prepared to sniff the air and taste the soil. Finally, it opened its eyes for a look at its new surroundings. Viking's first picture assignment was to photograph its own foot. In case Viking were to sink into Martian quicksand, we wanted to know about it before it disappeared. Back on Earth, we waited breathlessly for the first images. Viking painted its picture in vertical strokes, line by line, until with enormous relief, we saw the footpad securely planted in the Martian soil. This was the first image ever returned from the surface of Mars. The cameras on each Viking lander revealed a kind of rocky desert. Beyond the lander itself, we saw for the first time the landscape of the red planet. It didn't look like an alien world. There were rocks and sand dunes and gently rolling hills as natural and familiar as any landscape on Earth. Forever after, Mars would be a place.